to order the uh, City of Arvada City Council uh, meeting. This is a workshop. Um, Kristen Rush, could you do a roll call, please? Mayor Williams. Mayor Pro Tem Jones. Here. Council Member Piper. Here. Council Member Marriott. Here. Council Member Mormon. Here. Council Member Simpson. Council Member Smith. Uh, I didn't see whose light came on first. Uh, Mr. Marriott. Thank you, Your Honor. Move that we excuse uh, Mayor Williams, Council Member Simpson, and Council Member Smith. All right. All right. All votes are cast, and that passes unanimously four to zero with uh, Mayor Williams, uh, Ms. Smith, and Ms. Simpson being excused. All right, we will turn the time over to uh, Mr. Devin. For yes, thank you. For Tim, Deputy for Capital, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sharon Israel, who will uh, start us off on the water demand uh, forecast uh, update uh, for tonight. Hello. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and members of Council. Um, it's always a pleasure to get a chance to come and talk to you all about what's happening with the city's utilities. Um, tonight's uh, very focused and planned brief presentation on water demand. Um, I, I wanted to give it a little bit of background here. Um, we are scheduled to be here this evening and then again in two weeks and then again at the end of April. And there is a, there's a sort of method to that. So what you're hearing tonight is um, the results of a, a study that integrates engineering, operations, community and economic development. Um, this is forming the foundation for additional um, policy discussions we'd like to have with you uh, two weeks from tonight. Um, and then again, on discuss financial matters and level of service end of next month. Um, so I just wanted to sort of frame tonight's presentation for you. Um, with me this evening is um, Ryan Stachelski. He's gonna be one of my co-presenters and then also Mary Stahl. Um, you know Ryan and um, Mary is our uh, an engineering manager for utilities. And then of course we have Jacqueline Rhodes here, um, our city engineer. So real quick review, um, we're gonna talk about why this is important. Um, I have a very brief um, description of what we've done in the past, just to put this in context for you. Um, Ryan's gonna talk about how it fits in with um, the demographics and um, plan development, how we envision the future. Mary's gonna give you some technical details and I'm gonna wrap up next steps. Um, so just to start with the why, um, we are working on our strategic result that's specifically around master planning for um, water, sewer, and stormwater. And um, we've presented the results to you in previous sessions. Um, there's still a milestone out there, and that is by the end of 2023, end of next year, um, we will incorporate the findings from the master plans into our 10-year CIP and what we're calling our performance budget. We're actually looking at um, long-term, uh, decades-long financial planning um, that's gonna help us set a foundation for sustainable and resilient um, core services for our water and sewer and stormwater. Um, this is, uh, this is so why number two, this is one piece of our master plan work. Um, so it's about implementing the master plan findings. It's also, um, it does influence our, our funding needs and timing. Oh, let me back up one. I also want to point out that tonight we're talking about water demand. Um, we are uh, going to explore the supply update later this year. So if you think about the way we plan for how we use water in the city, there's the demand side, which is forecasting based on plan development, um, how much water we're going to need to use, and what infrastructure capacity needs to be in place to use it. And then um, there's a supply side where we're gonna dig into assumptions on all, our entire water rights portfolio. But that'll be another night later this year. 
Why number three is incredibly important because we don't ever want to overbuild our infrastructure, just like we never really want to underbuild our infrastructure. Um, and so finding that sweet spot where we're, we're matching the timing of planned development with the development of capacity and infrastructure, this is important. And that's why having Ryan and his team, um, the operations team, the engineering team all together on this is so important because it'll help us get our phasing right and then accordingly it'll help us get our operational, um, sorry, and CIP budget requests right. Um, so we, we avoid overbuilding or building things that maybe we don't need down the road. Um, and why number four? You're gonna see tonight um, from Mary's presentation um, on some of the specifics on how we developed how much water demand we forecast. Um, there are several different alternative futures we're contemplating, and they consider the impacts from water conservation, what kind of housing and density we're going to build, what pace of growth. And so to some extent, from a policy level, the council can give us direction on how to turn any of those dials. Um, so you're going to see a range of potential futures here. Um, but this, as, as you're watching it, think about Think about what is of interest to council to, um, to direct us on that may impact where we land in the future as far as demand. So um, this is the one slide on history of water demand I'm going to show you. Um, back in 2016, we, um, we did a similar effort. We um, used what was then um, considered a sort of, I would say, state of the art or the typical front range um, Colorado City means of planning for possible futures, and you'll see there are two lines there. Um, we estimated our demand at the time to be 25 to 27,000 acre feet um, out at, in those out years and build out. Um, what we've done with this study, and you're gonna see the results of, is a, we have been a lot more sophisticated this time around. Um, sophisticated in considering a lot of other potential futures, um, not just drawing uh, two lines based on mostly linear um, assumptions. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna wrap up here and give it to Ryan. He's gonna give you some context on how we're building the actual um, plan development and growth for the city into our forecasting. Uh, good evening, uh, thanks for having me. And what I wanna talk about is, so we're talking about demand, how do we know? Where, where are these numbers coming from and how much? And so I just have two quick slides here and I wanna talk a little bit about what we used in the model in order to kind of figure out what the future demands are going to be outside of the other um, constraints that Sharon just mentioned. So we have a current population based on the census uh, that came out in 2020 of uh, 124,000. That breaks down to about 100, or excuse me, 51,000 households that we have. We have a average household size of 2.5. That average household size has been very steady for the city of Arvada for the past 30 years or so. Um, so we've been really kind of rock solid at that 2.5. That doesn't mean it can't change in the future, but the range and even other municipalities around us um, doesn't get us much higher than about 2.7 or so. So we're lower, and um, part of that is, is because we're an aging population, as you've heard um, us talk about many times. One, I just find this fascinating that 62% of our households have one or two people in it. That's just an amazing statistic. Um, one that we've used before, um, but just really kind of shows about how um, uh, people are holding on to their houses longer and about how people are moving out. And so that's definitely a conversation that we would have in the affordable housing realm and other pieces, but for tonight, we're, we'll leave it at that. Um, we also have uh, about 21% of our households are attached. Um, so multifamily in some way. Um, that is on the lower end of the spectrum of the Denver metro area. Um, <clears throat> if you get into Boulder where it's a um, university town and they've also had policies for years that kind of require them to build multifamily, it gets into the 40%. Um, but in, in Lakewood and in, in those areas, you get into the high 20s and 30s. 
just as an FYI. Um, other interesting facts, historically, uh, over the past 60 years, we've been adding about 700 units uh, per year. But in the past 10 years, we've been lower than that. We've been adding about 500, and you can see the exact number there, um, but we've uh, a little over 500 units. So the past 10 years, although we've seen fairly steady growth, it's certainly not um, the fastest growth that we've seen. Um, we've seen double the amount of growth in the 70s and 80s than we actually saw in the, the tens or the teens, uh, the 2000 teens. Um, another uh, interesting fact is just how much commercial square footage do we have? We have uh, approximately 13 million, and you can see how it's broken down into three different categories, um, retail, office, and industrial. Um, so that's where we started with, or that's where we are today. Where are we going? Well, our comprehensive plan, which is our, our base level planning, which is assuming uh, the build out condition in terms of population, water supply, um, water demand, we believe that our population is going to reach kind of capacity at about uh, 153,000. So if you do the delta of that um, from where we are now and uh, where we will be, it's roughly 30,000 more people. Um, just using some math with our average household size, um, it, it means that we'll add roughly 10,000 more households before we get to build out if we stay consistent with our household size. And the other part of that is, so what is that uh, to be determined date? Like when are we going to reach that? Um, in the past 10 years, uh, we re our population increased by about 14,000. So if you just take that and you say, okay, the next 10 years are going to be the same, not that they are or aren't, um, but if you double that, you, you could reach that population in 20 years. Um, I will tell you that development in general is going to be more complicated as we move forward, and so the pace of development is also going to be uh, judged by a number of other factors, including cost, um, that, that may alter what that pace is. But it just gives you a little bit of generality that we're probably 20 to 30 years away from what a build-out population looks like. Um, and then lastly, uh, there's commercial that comes along with that population and, and how much more commercial. Um, I created these numbers essentially by just using the same um, ratios of commercial to population now um, because those have been fairly steady over time. So how much commercial are we using to support the amount of population? And if you do that at a high level, you look at um, uh, needing about 3.6 million more commercial broken down in that way. Now obviously the retail world is changing, the office world is changing, so those things may adapt as markets change going forward, um, but based on where we've been, that is our projection going forward. Uh, and Ryan, for, yes. Mr. Pfeiffer has a question. Okay. Okay, so, and just for a frame of reference, so uh, based on square footage of how much is on an acre in a building, um, 280, or excuse me, 250 acres is approximately how much land we're talking about. For a frame of reference, the new town area, the, what we call the new town area, which is roughly from Harkins down to I-70 and um, Costco over to Florida Corps is about 125 acres. So it's about double that, it's four tenths of a square mile. I could do other square footages, but you get the point, so. Mr. Anyway. Pfeiffer. Yeah, I, you know, I was, I was wondering when you said acres and we're talking about water, I just got confused for a minute to make sure. It's not acre feet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. a. Yeah, um, so, so now our land use does not support that, right? No, our comprehensive plan? Well, because you're showing, you know, 248 acres and I'm thinking of the Candelas area where we just got rid of a whole bunch of commercial space. We have over 200 acres of commercial vacant that, land in Candelas to, today. Today? So yes. that, that does cover it. Not mixed use, we're talking about the No, no, commercial. no, I'm talking about straight up commercial. commercial. Yeah. Where is that at? Well, we didn't do any rezoning, everything um, west of... Um, Indiana? Or it, well, of... Um, 
Well, the school, thank you. That, that's a good ge geography point um, of the school. So everything from 93 to oh. roughly Candela's Parkway, that's all. Where the there. water, the new water tank is and all that back area. Okay. Yeah, um, there's land around the Fortune property. Oh, and uh, then south, south of uh, South, uh, all south of King Supers, all that can okay. be commercial. So, and, and, that, and this is citywide, so it's not just um, in Candela's, but we, we have that acreage. So you do, we do have the acreage. That's more yes, general. We, it, 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 I didn't think about all the other space. So that is, now let me ask you with that, with, with that, oh, where was I going? So with that change, um, or maybe you're in another slide, so I might get ahead. So if I do, just tell me to wait. The use of water is different as we discussed between commercial, industrial, and even residential. Is that later in the slide? Oh, okay, then I'm gonna stop. I'll wait till then. All right, Mr. Mormon. Thanks. Yes. I, I, I've had the same question, so I'm gonna wait. Okay, thank you. Carry on. Well, I am done, and I'm gonna hand it off to <laughs> Mary. Perfect. But I'll be Great around. segue. Yep. All right, um, I will start with by saying I'm gonna try very hard not to completely geek out. Um, I feel so privileged to have worked with our Brown and Caldwell team. Um, we got their top modeler in the nation, and it was so much fun to work with someone who um, loves multi-sheet, um, like, I don't know, ZZ column type spreadsheets that <laughs> really delves into all kinds of detail. Um, but we are gonna keep this high level. But I do wanna give a lot of credit to Brown and Caldwell giving us their top modeler and, and letting us really drill down. Um, I'm gonna cover our process in doing this, um, what the drivers are specific to Arvada, and they're very similar to other communities, but they, they can vary depending on part of the country and specific to a community. Um, touch on historical trends for the last 20 years, um, then what did we model? What are the answers? Because that's what everyone wants to really know. But it is good to know the background before we get to the answer. So our process was to develop four scenarios. And the idea was to develop scenarios that are plausible. Um, does not mean that they will happen, but they are plausible. And I love this figure down um, in the bottom corner of the presentation because it shows how our future can diverge. And, um, and that's where Sharon mentioned um, state of the industry for this has moved from a single or two line uh, projection to a range of projections. And what we're trying to do is to get plausible scenarios that bracket what our demand could be. Um, and it does provide us the ability to right size and smartly phase our infrastructure. So in other words, we look at the next 10 years, 20 years, because it takes 10 years to build lots of this infrastructure, and then we take another look in 10 years and 10 years later. But always making sure that we could hit either one of those without overbuilding. Um, and additionally, these scenarios allow us to have insight on the demand drivers. So what are our demand drivers? Obviously population growth. Um, people use water in their homes and that definitely drives our, our water use. Density and the type of housing drive our use. Um, household size uh, does impact use. With that density and type of housing and the household size, uh, it was mentioned about our aging population. I found this fascinating, it made sense when I thought about it. Um, an older population uses less water per person than a younger population. And if you think about that, if you have young kids, you are doing, I don't know, 10 times the amount of laundry as you do when you're single or when you're 60. Um, but older um, people tend to take less showers, tend to do less things that require more intensive uses of water. Um, so I found that very fascinating. Uh, conservation is definitely a driver, um, and I will get into implicit and explicit conservation. And then um, we also incorporated climate change into these, uh, into the scenarios, so that we can look at what that could do to our water use. This is a data-driven process. Um, so, so many things went into this. Um, the comprehensive plan, obviously. Uh, the Dr. Cog TAS, that's a lot of letters. Uh, Denver Regional Council of Governments. TAS is the traffic analysis zone, and they're very small pieces of land. I think they might even be smaller than like um, your uh, voting precinct, um, where uh, Dr. Cog has taken a look at employment and housing um, in each one of those. So uh, the modeler pulled that information in. The state demographer 
uh, was used for data source. Recent water use. We got really detailed um, over a couple of years of data use, and then we looked at bigger trends over 20 years. Conservation impacts. This was um, a fabulous thing, having their top modeler. She knew so much about how conservation can impact water use, both with implicit and explicit, and how to model that. Uh, implicit means things, conservation that's going to happen without us doing anything. That started with the 1992 Energy Act that uh, set limits on how much water fixtures could use. The Colorado legislature took that another step in 2016 when they said we could only buy water sense fixtures in Colorado. So we know that Arvada as a community has not um, fully incorporated that with remodels on older homes and that kind of thing. So the model incorporates that implicit conservation into the future, into a plausible time frame of uh, all fixtures being replaced. Explicit conservation for Arvada is really around outdoor use. How much are we going to use? What kind of um, landscaping are we going to have? And are we going to have any regulations around watering of that landscaping? Um, and then lastly, the last piece of data that we used was to make sure that um, for the on-trend scenarios, which I will get to, that we stayed consistent with the land use projections done for the sanitary sewer master plan. In other words, we're making sure that the water and the sanitary side match each other. So historical trends. Um, this graph, um, it only has two pieces, but lots of information. So the blue bars are um, population from 2000 to 2020. And the interesting part is that population change has been about 21%. The black line is the average day production um, for that year. Um, and you can see it really hasn't changed. It jumps around, and it jumps around because of weather or because we've implemented um, drought restrictions. But if you were to try and do a line of best fit, it'd pretty much be a straight line. Um, that is a front range trend. We are not alone. Almost every water provider has seen this trend. And a lot of that has to do with implicit water conservation. It also has to do with what we've called the drought shadow, which was after the 2002-2003 drought. Um, people saw that their lawns did OK with less water, and water use never really rebounded to where it had been before. So what were the modeled scenarios that we thought were plausible but would capture the range of our potential water demand? On trend, it's exactly what Ryan just talked about. Um, everything that he talked about, that's what on-trend means. And then we asked them to look at on-trend, but let's take um, a more proactive approach on outdoor conservation. What would that do, just so we know? It's not saying we have to, but it's good to know. Then the next two looked at, what if we looked at maximum growth? Meaning we push uh, housing density, we push policies that bring us more young families, less elderly, older populations, as many people as we think would fit in a comfortable manner. I mean, it's not saying multifamily housing everywhere. Um, one of those looked at using um, quite a bit more conservation, and one of those said, nope, we're going to say climate change, and we're not going to put any restrictions on outdoor watering to give us that upper limit of what potential water use could be. So the results, what everyone wants to know, right? Um, so the black line on the left is jagged all over a place. Once again, that is our demand. This time it is in average production, meaning acre feet per year. So that's how much water the city um, provided to customers in a single year. The lines on the right side are the four trends. And so we can see that from um, the lowest to the highest, we range from about 19,000 acre feet to about 23, 24,000 acre feet. That is in an average year, and I'll get to the hot years and the cool years in a minute. Um, so in comparison to the one that Sharon showed, um, that is a little bit lower. Um, so the work done in 2016 used a per capita demand of 145 gallons per person per day, which was about what we were using in 2015, 2016. In 2020, we used about 135 gallons per person per day. So that was kind of our max starting line on that per capita for any of those. And I think that really um, 
explains the difference between this work and the work five or six years ago for the most part. Plus, I, we've obviously sharpened our pencils a whole lot more on this um, because, as I said, that, that model has um, so, many, so many sheets, so many columns, so much fun to dig into. Um, the interesting part is that on these range of projections, it ranges from about 120 gallons per person per day up to about 135. Um, and that really, that difference is primarily due to age of population and how much outdoor water use there is. Um, the part that is also really interesting is hot weather and cooler weather. This is average year weather. Different from climate change, just, this is just the year to year variations. Um, hot weather increases our use from average by about 11%. Cool rainy weather decreases our use by about 13% from average weather. So it's really quite a range. So this is fabulous for the water supply study that Sharon mentioned. Does not help us with infrastructure. We kind of need to know max day. So they, uh, Brown and Caldwell also gave us some information about maximum day. So the graph shows, um, again, average weather. Um, they are water resources people. Water resources people love average day, um, average year. Um, but the, uh, in the text above, it, it um, indicates that these range of scenarios, we could be from 44 to 54 million gallons per day when we are looking at a hot, dry year. So that is what, those are the ranges we're going to be looking at as we look to replace infrastructure or if we need additional capacity on infrastructure. As I said, we can geek out unbelievably if you'd like. Um, there's unbelievable amounts of detailed information in the report, use by sector, is it single family, multifamily, commercial, irrigation, where is it in the city, um, weather, um, and as I said, per capita demand. Um, the graph on the right is just to kind of give you an idea of the range for weather. Um, the line is that average day that we talked about, and then the, the band shows cool weather versus hot weather. Are there any questions before I take it back to Sharon? Actually, I, I have a question. Sure. One of the, you know, the, to me, one of the, the looks at this has been that the effect that conservation of, has had over time, that we're using the same amount of water we were 25 years ago, even though we're 25% bigger. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty big number of, of kind of change of, of usage in household. Do you have any idea how much of that conservation, that part that's made the difference here, is due to just general trends or people's living trends versus mandated conservation measures? So in Arvada, it is primarily due to that implicit uh, for indoor. Uh, mm -hmm. And then outdoor, I think it's more just reaction, if you were here, for the drought. Um, in 2002, um, as well as some of the messaging Denver Water did for a number of years, and I think just to raised awareness. To my knowledge, our, and I've been here 20 years, I've lived in Arvada 20 years, the only time we've had mandatory conservation was in response to drought in 2003 and 2013. So, so Right, so this, this conservation's happened just as a, a reflection of societal change or just kind right. of people's attitudes or... or Vo vo voluntary, voluntary kind of differences in them. Yeah, in a and and I think sometimes learning. I watched um, when I moved in. My, they still do kind of. Um, they we called them the old men on the block. Please don't take any offense, but they were all retired, <laughs> and their wives didn't care about the lawns, but they competed to see who could be the closest to a golf course. <laughs> and in 2003, they learned that they could use less water and still win that competition. Hmm. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mormon. Yes, thank you. Um, so when they did the modeling and they were showing the different um, scenarios and the one with the conservation in it, what, in their model, what are they thinking is, are the conservation, actual conservation measures that are being implemented under that scenario? So they gave us a range, but I think the one that they were really looking at was a mandatory watering schedule which has been implemented in a number of communities, both in Colorado and across the country, and has been shown to be very effective in reducing use. It, there's no it, limit on use. It just becomes a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday um, restriction. 
Um, I was gonna say Sharon's got the whole list for me. <laughs> it's Jacqueline who gave it. To oh, me, okay. So. <laughs> um, the other things that um, the, the permanent irrigation scheduling is what they really kind of kept kept hammering at me. It was probably the most effective, but. Uh, there's others um, along water budget based rates where you tell people your lot should only use X amount of water. If you use more, your rates will be more versus the block rate that we use now. Um, to uh, have prohibitions on water waste, which I think we already do, um, but to be uh, more prohibitive on that or more uh, sort of a, a higher penalty for doing water waste. Um, and then um, Implementing Xeriscape, there can be, uh, this is where policy comes in, changing code. Some cities still require bluegrass in the front lawns. Um, obviously that um, would require more water than allowing other kinds of uh, landscaping in front lawns. Um, so uh, I think those are the really big ones. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pfeiffer? So, so let's go back to the question that I'll probably ask, maybe all of you can answer. It's around, you know, commercial, industrial, and residential has different <coughs> use of water. I brought this up in several hearings. And I think one thing that as a, pol as a let's say, a policymaker or decision maker of policy is around the impacts to our water plan, lack of a better word. Do we feel that, I think we're at a point where I feel for me to make decisions when we change land use, how does it, just like how the school and the fire district weigh in on impacts of that development, we should probably also know the impacts of our water infrastructure. Either one of you, I, it's more, maybe not a question, maybe more of a statement maybe. But I, I would like to see that because when we have big change like I had with with um, Candelis's commercial switch, it, it made sense, but there was a big impact to our water because it, it went from commercial to residential, somewhere between 650 homes to 900, whatever day it is or whatever it ends up being. That's a lot compared to commercial buildings, right, Ryan? I mean, we had that conversation at that hearing. I think we need to know those changes up front when we have these type of hearings that we know for a fact that the increase will be X amount of acre feet, we, you know, you do say, well, we have it, but then we have discussions like, well, the infrastructure wasn't there, or, or we needed to do a, a water, I didn't know about the water tank until this year. I didn't know we were doing that for pressure and impacts. But the developer caused that, but yet, you know, they, I think they contributed a little bit, JCMD contributed a little bit to it, but mm -hmm. those impacts should be eyes wide open when we make changes, especially when we add 650 homes to an area that wasn't anticipated to have 650 additional homes. So I'm wondering if, if when we do these larger land use discussions or zone changes, that we really get a 360 degree view of those impacts. How does it impact stormwater? How does it impact our sewers? How does it impact our, our water usage? Like numbers, not like, no, we got it. Uh, no, I wanna know is it how many acre feet? So is, is that something that, are we planning to, to do moving forward or? So a couple things and Sharon can um, certainly weigh in. Um, so when we did the analysis, uh, and Mr. Sullivan did the analysis for when we converted the Trailstone area uh, from commercial, it was a, actually mixed use to commercial. We did do a water supply analysis and um, determined that the difference between what was being proposed today, what is being built today, and commercial um, that was being proposed there previously, the difference in acre feet was three. So we did exactly what you're talking about and we were able to show that the difference in acre feet that was needed in those two uh, scenarios was negligible or equal. The one thing that I want to uh, um, kind of point out is the difference between water supply, which is talking about the overall water supply that's coming in that the city's going to use and then treat and, and turn into um, treated water that goes to places, and then water operations where we're talking about tanks and pipes and pumps. Those are two separate issues and two things that need to be discussed um, not independent of one, of one each other, but the water supply doesn't necessarily 
um, indicate whether or not we have efficient operations in order to meet um, uh, the demand for development. So what you're talking about and with the water tanks and the pumps and the other things that we're talking about, the new information, that is based on infrastructure in terms of operations and making sure that we have the appropriate pressures and those types of things. But what is not a concern in that scenario is having the amount of water needed. It's about having the amount of operational infrastructure that's in place in order to serve at the rate of uh, households or commercial buildings or whatever is there. It's a, it's a little nuanced, but it's a little different than the, those two scenarios. So, I, I, so a couple of things. I, we're using one scenario, but it's a scenario we should all use as a good example. But in that argument there, I asked the question, what was the consumable water that is being used, house versus commercial? And I got a clear number that is not just negligible. It was a huge difference. It was like a 40% difference. It was a huge number. So a house per foot uses X, commercial uses what per foot? So if I do three million you know, square feet of commercial, it uses how much water versus three million of residential, it uses how much water? I don't think it's three acre feet. I, it, it depends on the use. It, so there, there are so many variables into that. You, you, there's not a one for one. I can tell you that a household, we do, for a single family equivalent, we do two houses per acre foot, right. correct? For planning purposes. For planning purposes. For commercials, I don't know the... Range. So it's, it's not apples to apples in that, and you have to know whether or not... I mean, a school is different than a restaurant is different than a chiropractic office or those types of things. So all those things are a little bit different, but we can provide uh, the analysis we did in the Candela's area. Because um, I think that intent was... It was supposed to be like an interlock in another tech center, you know, multi workspace. So we did kind of know what we wanted there. Yeah. Um, it was not going to be a water bottling company or, you know, chiropractors all over the place or dentists like they are today. That I, I get that, but we we knew what was planned for that area, which was office buildings. Yes. And there was certain water, and what what I was driving in that hearing was. I want to know what we planned for what was existing. We are changing it, and what is the difference impact? You're saying it's three acre feet. Yes. I have a hard time believing that because I asked these questions during that when there was, I think it was a 40% um, increase to residential from commercial of what we planned. We are happy. To, I, okay. I have the spreadsheet. I can but see it in my head. I just don't want to. I think the point, the point yeah. I'm trying to make is I think those are, that's the detailed information when we make big land use discussions because it, it does bother me that we're having all this infrastructure discussion and capacity construct, uh, discussion, but yet we're just building away, building away, building away, thinking, oh, you're bringing your own water. We got it. We got it. We got it. We're good, 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 good. And then come to find out we get a new, exec a new director over it, it's slightly a different story. We're not all good. There is some impacts from all of this growth and built, but I don't feel we had that story at the time when we have these hearings. And that's why I struggle with eyes wide open, man. I wanna know that if we make this change, what is the impact? I want numbers because there's an operations impact, there's an infrastructure impact, there is, and what is the developer picking up versus the metro district or not? Or what is, what is the city picking up? And right now, I think we're holding a bag with some infrastructure impacts because of all the development we did and we didn't know about it. We didn't plan for it. It's not, it was not in our budgets till recently. Right, no? Well, I, so there's a, there's a couple things uh, in that. Um, I think we are planning for it. I think that the master plan work is exactly what we're talking about doing. Um, so there are, there are a couple of, um, different scenarios that you're painting. Um, and But what I know is that this team is on top of looking at what our infrastructure needs are based on planned growth uh, in order to fulfill those core services. Um, and this is part of the process of iterative looking at the operations side as well as the um, supply side. So I believe the information that was received when this went from residential, from commercial, the data is going to prove, from commercial to residential, excuse me, um, it, it's going to show 
uh, what we've said, which is from a water supply or a water demand side, that those two scenarios are equal, okay. and, and we have the data to show that, so I'm not worried about that. The, the other side of it is, as we continue to grow, we've always known that we needed to look at our infrastructure master plans in water, wastewater, and stormwater. That's what this team has been doing relative to those master plans. And now that we're collecting that data, we are implementing it and putting it into our CIP work. So I think we're really on the same page as you. We are just in that moment of time where it's critical that um, we are having these conversations um, and is growth uh, driving some of that? Yes, but also the age of our infrastructure is also driving that. Um, there are a lot of factors that are driving that and that's part of the normal course of what we do when we maintain in a responsible way um, our city's infrastructure. Okay, I think my ask is I, I know the data when you propose any type of development. That's really what my ask is, is sure. when you do it, I wanna know because I want it listed on the document so when we go back and look at this institutional knowledge of these developments that we see maybe happen five, six, ten years later, that I can go back and say it was said here that there was no impact for this development out in here on the infrastructure. I struggle with what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I struggle with it because I believe there's been many, 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 many developments and sometimes we forget about what's underground at the end of the day. And and I just want to, I want a holistic view. When we get land development that's large, we should just, we should get know that everyone understands and that, Sharon, you can't come back to me and ask for bigger pipes when you signed off on a 650 home place. You should have called it out then. There's a, there's a point where you have to say, uncle, I'm done. I can't, the system cannot do it. It's a disservice. Just because the developer's chomping over here, wanting to get to it because we held them back because of our infrastructure, the one that's out there, we, we should have known this way before we change it to say this is what has to happen, not, not when the developer's ready to move dirt, right? So I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. I just say let's get the answer in front of us so we can make informed decisions if that's something we want to approve, knowing that there's an operating a capital expense and stresses on our system. We should go eyes wide open. So I think that that's an excellent segue into what we're going to be talking about on March 28th. So two weeks from now, so we are at a critical path of saying we can maintain planned development. Um, however, we need resources in order to be able to do that in order to meet those demands and then we're going to articulate what those resources are in the workshops that um, Sharon kind of laid out there in the beginning. So let me ask her, sorry, coming over to you now. From a legal perspective, is there any, anything that would cause a development that's in front of us for review, a hearing, for us to deny it based because we don't have the infrastructure to support it? It probably depends on what comes in front of you. I'd have to look at the specific criteria, um, but there are oftentimes criteria that you could integrate that in. I know when we were talking about, um, for instance, the, the use, the conditional use determinations, there's one criteria in there that talks about um, us understanding that we have the infrastructure to support the specific mm -hmm. kind, of, mm -hmm. kind of use that's in front of you. There are often criteria for various different determinations that um, focus into that. Okay. Thank you. Got a couple more questions before we go too much further, Mr. Marriott. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on something Mr. Mormon said when you were talking about um, uh, watering days in the summer. So this past summer we had a uh, had a little because of delivery issues only, not because of capacity issues. But uh, we had a little test of that up in Candela's where they were asked to only water on certain days to spread the demand out over days. Did we see a reduction in usage? And that so it wasn't it, it did reduce the total amount used when when people were asked to only use certain days um, yes so that was um, a specific candelis area restriction um, what it did it is it helped keep the peak demand on any right. one day down and it absolutely did help with that um, well, now well, as far as overall water usage we didn't see a major reduction what we saw was the reduction in the peak right. which um, which is important because it saves money if you're not designing to the peak. Right. If you can design to a lower peak, you can design a lower 
capacity of infrastructure, which saves real money. Right. So, yeah. so I think that was my that was my yeah. question. I think you did it better than I did. Was that you know spreading people's watering days out changes the peak usage, but does it change the total usage? Is that an effective strategy for reducing the total usage of water, or does that just even out when the same amount of water is used. I, I think Mary's reading my mind. I'm going to let her answer okay. this. Yes, yeah. yeah, so there's, um, yes, it absolutely reduces peak. In terms of our own little experiment, you, we need more than one year because um, it's so weather dependent as well. Um, if we think about um, the, the last two little lines on that graph up there that are still black, we can see that there was a huge change between 2019 and 2020 just because of weather. And so, unless we have the exact same weather every year, which we don't, that's why it's weather, we need more than one years of data to, to really tease out um, mm -hmm. how much water we can save, which is where we relied on Brown and Caldwell, our consultant, to use um, both national and regional data to mm -hmm. put that into their model. So they have some factor that they use in their model, and right. their, their factor must show then that there is a total usage difference, even though we may or may not have Correct. Have seen that in our little pilot program. Kind of yes. Unintentional pilot program out of Ken Dulles. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mormon. Yes. Um, I'd like to make a request. I'm, I'm a data person, and so I'd love to see the um, historical data comparing water use. And, and I get like commercial, there's all wide range, like a restaurant versus a barbershop. But do we have some, some historical data to kind of break that down or have a better understanding as we are, you know, I think to Mr. Pfeiffer's, you know, point is that as we are looking to, to further develop change developments in the city, I really want to have that data at hand to know, you know, this is the kind of development that's being proposed and have an understanding of what that water use is. Um, I mean, I like I said, I get that commercial is a wide range, but I would like to see the breakdown of the types of commercial and the uses. And the same goes with single family versus multifamily. Um, I've heard a lot of debate about which uses more water, and I'd like to see the historical data in Arvada on that as well. I can speak to single family versus multifamily. We definitely have that data. On the commercial side, there's a lot of published data on the differences between the different types of uses. I don't know. I've only been here 13 months for mm -hmm. an employee. I've lived here 20 years, but um, so I'm going to share and take that. <laughs> we're, um, we're, we're looking to do more with that, Council Member Mormon. And there's a couple things that are going to enable us to do that better. One is the smart meter technology that's being installed. So we'll be able to get um, data readily um, throughout the day, in fact, if we want to, on all the different customers and categories of customers. So right now, um, I would say that to be responsive to what I hear you asking for is a whole database programming type effort, um, which we can do, absolutely. With the smart meters that are rolling out, though, it's, it's going to be literally at our fingertips. Um, in, the, in the interim, we, we do address a lot of this in much more detail in the written report, um, which Jacqueline can wave at you, maybe. Do you have the written report? Oh, it's right here. I'll wave it at you. It's um, extensive. So happy to share that with you, too, and walk you through any of it. Um, I think that may be helpful to sort of fill the gap without... Um, again, this is up to, you know, council direction. If we wanted to do a big database project, but there's, it's, the data's not readily available to parse it quite the way you asked right now. I, I understand that. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, if you could send me the report, and again, my intent is that when we get new rezoning requests or proposals, that I, I just want to have the most information available to make those decisions, and especially around, you know, do we have the available water for this proposal? Um, and so if, if you can provide that, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, and there are great frameworks around that that I've seen used in other cities. I think that um, the, Ryan mentioned this, the discussion that we're bringing forward in two weeks from tonight really digs into a lot of this and more granularity in the short term because we do have planned developments coming with very specific um, uh, specifications. And um, that's helping us make some, well, that's helping us bring to you some policy decisions that we're gonna have to make on 
on not just sort of far out projections, but actually very near term in the next few years uh, projections. Um, I also, I, I feel like um, we touched on it tonight, but I think this is important too, that um, we're talking about water supply in the context of demand. So if you look at our, open up our water rights portfolio and see how much that is, we're revisiting that later this year also um, because we wanna make sure that the assumptions that went into that considering climate change, drought, variability, um, the contracts that we have with Denver Water, that um, we just are, are using the most modern type analysis to really understand supply. Um, the demand we decided to do first, again, emphasizing some of what we're trying to figure out is how to pace all these projects. You've seen me come up and along with this team over the last year um, with very significant shortfalls in our revenue to be able to actually build all the capacity that we need. So now it's that timing piece that's so important. Like we know we're gonna need to build this much capacity at the treatment plant. What this demand forecasting does for us is enables us to be more um, strategic and exactly when when that all gets phased. So I want to be clear that we're talking about water, like wet water, how much water people are going to use, but it's that whole uh, delivery operation that goes with it. Um, so again, two weeks from tonight, we have some some more details that we'll go into and, and some specific requests for feedback from council on how we proceed. Thank you. Mr. Pfeiffer, you still have a question? Uh, yeah, do you, do you have a question? No, no, no. I okay. just want to, I saw your light on, I just want to make well, sure. Well, uh, just to make sure, we're taking a lot of bites at the apple, and I, I know. make sure you had a few. No. Nope. Hey, so uh, this is probably more in general because it does probably inform us in our policy, but um, one of the things, do we still do the surcharge, or if you use more than your, I, my wife pays the bills, I don't pay the bills, sorry, but do we still charge if you use too much water? We still have that, right? We never got rid of it, did we? There's a surcharge in the code for when there's over watering for a drought, um, under drought restrictions. But we don't charge uh, $2 more per whatever thousand gallons or any. We have a tiered structure. Yeah, so, so we do charge. Yeah, okay, so, so we, we have, yeah, no, the, the, the 5,000th gallon is gonna cost you more than the first gallon. So the tiered structure, that's been around since the drought, really. I mean, that's where that came from. We just kept it this whole time, right? So. Has there been any thought of thinking about that a little bit more? Because as I've struggled with, with that tiering process because I believe families that are larger are penalized. Mm -hmm. And yet if I was one or two, which is 60%, it, it, you get no penalty, you're fine. But you know, don't have a kid, otherwise you're screwed and you move to another you know, tier because you're using more water than the 5,000 or whatever the... Have we thought of looking at that a little bit more? Because I just... I mean, when you look at a house that's a five, six, seven bedroom, and you're you're you're, and it's on a half acre, it it doesn't yeah. seem it's fair to somebody that's on you know a thousand square foot or eight eight hundred square foot, two bedroom, ranch, but yet we're being held to the same watering standards, as others. I'll, I've got a couple kind of thoughts along those lines. One is that we have uh, currently have engaged a consultant on our. Um, uh, on financial planning for the utility. And one of the things he's looking at is our rate structure, our fee structure, and also our tap fee structure. And um, so what you just described in terms of are we setting tiers the right way is very much a, there's a body of knowledge around it. And so we're, we're tapping that consultant to help advise us. Um, the other is, um, it's certainly a policy decision and, and some other cities even here on the front range have made it, Mary mentioned it in the, it's one of the tools in the toolbox for water conservation, which is a water budget. And so um, that is feasible, it's complex, it does require more city staff to administer. Um, however, it, it, it has been adopted by some other jurisdictions for the reasons that you described. Um, what, so, how do, I, Well, I guess we'll learn more about a budget. I mean, because I, I think what, when I talk about fairness or equitable, I mean, I know that we have to do something with conservation but there should be at least a baseline because you don't know how many people are in my house. You know, I have three boys, or if you have three girls, or a mix of, you know, there might be more showers than one or the other. I don't know. I think boys take too many showers sometimes. It depends how old they are. 
but you consume more and you want to conserve, but is there a way to baseline, like you do with energy, like uh, with electricity, you can baseline your average use, spread it over. If you jump up 20%, then you'll be charged a surcharge or something because you spiked. I, I'm not saying that's a solution, but a solution that might be more equitable uh, for folks, but yet we still need the hint of con conservation in that conversation as well. And I'm sure you'll get the, the you know, Odyssey of the Minds together and, and figure it out, right? Does anyone know what an Odyssey of the Minds? <laughs> oh, there's a few. That's a great reference, thank you. Um, Odyssey of the Minds team. <laughs> um, so what we're talking about are some of these dials that we can turn to address our revenue requirements and needs while also doing it in as fair a way as possible. And that mm -hmm. is absolutely where um, we need direction on what policy we want for our VADA. Okay. Um, because I think those different options are, are absolutely there. Um, and maybe your smart meters will help with it, you know, in some way. Because sometimes if you just, like you said, I think you've said this before in another presentation, you give that in, in information to the homeowner, maybe they'll make better decisions. Yeah. It's just like, you know, navigation maps or yeah. apps that make decisions on when you should drive and not drive. Maybe it, you can make decisions when you should use water or not use water. Absolutely, thank you. The other question, uh, and I don't know who has the answer around this one was, you know, I recall us having this conversation, I hope I'm not too far off the conversation around, when developers came, they were supposed to bring their water, their rights. Where are we with that? Because I was always an impression that developers would bring water rights yeah. for our supply side, right? Yes, so um, we, we do not at this time accept water rights for development unless they meet very specific criteria. We can still do that. Um, but where we have um, sort of implemented that in the northwest part of the city, JCMD is our partner, and they have brought a certain amount of water rights allocated, and then we draw that down with each development until they basically go to zero. And then they'll be they will no longer get discounted tap fees from the city. Okay. So that's, that's the process that we use to sort of accept water rights and then in exchange provide a discounted tap fee. Um, we're no longer entertaining that unless we've got water rights that are coming in with very specific criteria. Um, and, and to be specific, there are certain ditches we're looking for um, and then we would want them changed for municipal use. Um, to my knowledge, there are no, no such shares on the market right now. Um, the rest of the water supply for uh, development as contemplated in the comprehensive plan is gross reservoir. And so when I said there's several dials we turn when we're talking about what, how to meet revenue requirements, tap fees are a big one. And tap fees are where we program in the cost of developing that additional water supply. So that's a long answer to your question, but I think the short answer is no. I'm, well, so I, I mean, there's good and bad with that answer. Yeah. I mean, you know, we should, just like we try to get developers to pay for their growth, they should probably bring the water associated instead of putting it on the backs of the rest of the taxpayers to get gross reservoir to, to grow. I, I struggle with that a little bit. Um, but if that is our plan, then we need to make sure that we don't create development that taxes our um, supply so hard that we're out looking for more. So we, there, there needs you. to be a very harmonization between this. I keep stressing this. I think this is why I was saying it earlier. And I, I don't, because we don't see how the sausage is made up here, but we need the information and the com comfort that that is happening. Yeah. Because the last thing I want to see is an $80 million worth of, uh, you know, infrastructure or supply issues or 120 million or 300 or half a billion dollars of, of cost to the citizens because we didn't, we didn't, we didn't know what we didn't know. And so we need to do our best to try to be informed as we make decisions on how our city is built out. Um, thank you, and I, I do want to make a comment on who's paying for gross reservoir. So it's been our longtime philosophy for tap fees and developer contributions to pay their way, um, which means that the, the dollars that are actually going to pay for gross reservoir are coming from tap fees from new customers. Um, so I, I, I wanted to make sure that, that, um, that I had clarified that particular piece. Um, so tap fees go only to supply, not infrastructure? So no, 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 tap fees have three components right now. Um, so we got $120 million worth of tap fees to pay for gross or however much we're at now? We have, um, we have been putting money aside from tap fees into the fund balance for 
10 years? Brian, where's Brian Archer? We need him at least 10 years. So, so tap fees have several components to them. One is a water supply component. One is a water treatment plant component. So that's that operations piece that we use to treat the water. And then they have a component that's also the distribution system. And, and that's been um, historically reevaluated on a periodic basis. When I told you earlier that we have a series of, of workshops scheduled um, with council over the next few months, that will be a very important topic um, because our tap fees for sewer, for example, haven't been increased for 11 years. Um, our tap fees for water were increased a moderate amount five years ago. So um, I, I, we, we have a whole discussion planned with council on, on potential ways we can adjust those and, and raise revenue that we're going to be doing later this year. Um, but I think it's really important to, for, for us to you know, help, help clarify that our philosophy is that growth will continue to pay for itself. We're not paying for gross reservoir with ratepayer funds. So, so in the last 10 years, we've had um, approximately 5,200 households if you do 2.5 people per household. That's on so, the so how did we get to, I'm just trying to figure out how we got $120 million off just a one third of a tap fee. If the tap fees haven't gone up, I, the math doesn't make sense to me at all. Well, I, I, Sorry, I shouldn't I, be doing I, this I, up here, I think we'd but, be remiss to try to do math up here, oh, yeah. <laughs> especially when we weren't really involved in those things. So your questions are valid. Could, and, could and you just get we, us information on it later? Yes. Maybe? And, yeah. and, and yes. to Sharon's point, we are having this conversation on April 25th where all of this will go into a lot more detail. So I don't want to deflect your question. I just don't want to give the answer when I'm probably the least qualified person. Well, and just there. be prepared maybe more than anything. Yep. We can, uh, Thank you. Council Member Pfeiffer, we'll engage our finance director in oh, providing yeah, you. Oh, he's not here. Well, we didn't huh. know you were going to ask some of oh, the questions sorry. you did. Some, those of us that are mathematically challenged, uh, 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 we, can, we can have that question answered at our future workshop where Brian, I think, can, can um, uh, provide the, the um, historical background on how we generated uh, basically the, the, the cash financing of gross reservoir through TAP fees. Okay, I, I thought it was a mix of other revenue sources. That's why I'm struggling with the TAP fees. I, I thought there was some uh, other revenues coming in as well that covered because, you know, the numbers jump from we had 80 million, now we're at 120 million. And maybe, yeah. maybe some background on that for our next one would be good for sure. all of us up here. Yeah. Um, and that probably would answer how we got there. Plus, my calculator doesn't go that high, so I can't, I can't, I can't do any more. I'm sorry, I tried my best. You, gotta you lucked out. Cut some zeros off and <laughs> just add them to each. Yeah, I don't do it that way. I do it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> so, all right, these are these are good, but those are the kind of things I'd like to hear at our next Great. workshop Thank because you. I think that helps us understand like how we're doing this, and because we're coming to the end of build out, um, and it does influence density. And so we need to talk about density. I mean, there's, there's a lot. So the more intelligent we become, which Sharon, you've done a great job forcing us to learn your world, which is hard. I think we can, we can all dream to be water engineers one day or whatever you call, but, you know. Thank you. Um, um. But the, you have to, you have to uh, I would just ask for your patience with at least me because this is this is area we've talked about and we kind of thought it was okay, it's okay, we don't hear it, we don't hear it, it must be okay, but you're highlighting, uh, we're getting to the point where we have to address it. And, um, but there's so many factors associated to just water, it's land use, it's development, it's density, it's all sorts of other things, parks, or parks in the parking lots like I wanted in the commercial. I mean, those, it does impact those kind of things. If we want commercial, we want to make them beautiful, but we may have to impact water. It, it's confusing for us up here if we're not fully informed, and that's why I say let's go in this with eyes wide open, because then we make an intentional decision knowing uh, our information and the facts around it, right? I, so, I, I think that's in everyone's best interest to do that, and um, as Ryan said it, and as I did in the introduction, tonight is a piece, it's a foundational piece because it drives another element that is timing. 
So we can find the technical solutions to everything. We have ability to make policy decisions on water use and, and maybe even building more water supply. Um, but the timing is coming from other pressures as well. And so I wish we had all the time in the world to be making these decisions and recommendations, but what, what we're gonna talk about more in two weeks is, um, is what, what that's looking like too, so. I appreciate it, thank you, Mayor Pertem. Thank you. Mr. Mormon. Um, I, I, I'm excited about the continual conversation that I'm hearing we're gonna be having, and just I guess just wanna emphasize that when it comes to our conversation around conservation measures, I hope there'll be an opportunity to kind of dig pretty deep into those, looking at what the policy pieces might be for us and our options and how effective they are, looking at you know other communities that have implemented them, just really kind of explore that. I'm you know thinking about things like also building codes, you know, is that a factor that we should be considering in, in terms of our water conservation? Yeah. Um, and then I you know note too that um, at the state legislature, we've got House Bill 221151 that is, you know, turf replacement program that we might have an opportunity to tap into and, and utilize. So those kind of things need to be our tools in the toolbox and that, that I'm hopeful we'll be, be able to get into the toolbox and really evaluate each of those tools. So I think you can go on with the rest of your presentation. Thank, thank you. I think there are maybe two slides left, but let me give a shout out to our, um, the city's partnership with Resource Central. We are here, local to Arvada, uh, supporting um, turf removal this year. So check it out. Um, it's on our website. All right, we've covered some of these next steps, so some final comments here. Um, as Mary mentioned, we've got this range of forecasts. Um, what we're trying to do is when we're making our design decisions for infrastructure, that we're considering that range. So not, build, not overbuilding above or underbuilding below. Um, I can't emphasize enough the timing um, because timing is about um, the demand for planned development. Timing is about how long it's gonna take us to raise revenue. Um, timing is also about our own internal engineering staffing resources and how fast we can deliver capital projects. So timing will be a big topic in the next, uh, at our next presentation. Um, and then as Council Member Mormon just said, there are some policy decisions around things like water conservation um, that we'll be bringing to you that will help us dial in um, uh, what our future forecasting looks like. Um, but as you've heard me say before, there are enormous cap um, capacity needs that we need to develop. We're gonna talk about that in two weeks. And um, also the competing priority, which is the reinvestment work we need to do. Um, we have a, um, storage tanks that are 50, 60 years old. Our um, bread and butter Ralston water treatment plant 60 years old. Um, so as we're talking about building capacity, we can't forget that there's also a significant amount of reinvestment that needs to be done. And by the way, we also love to do that as water engineers, so that's gonna be awesome. Um, okay, so next steps, we're returning to you in two weeks, as I mentioned. Um, end of April, um, we wanna have a conversation with you about level of service. That's sort of our service level agreement that we have with the community. We don't, we don't have that spelled out officially, um, but our team has been working hard to really fine tune what that looks like. So when we talk about level of service and we talk about the revenue requirements needed to maintain that level of service, we have that common understanding. So looking forward to that'll be in April. Um, we also have a water supply study we're gonna be doing later this year. And um, we haven't talked a lot about the sewer tonight, um, but that is, uh, ha also has competing pressures. Um, for especially timing for our, our internal capacity to deliver cap, um, deliver capital projects. Um, so I think that is, yeah, that is the last slide. Um, <laughs> all right, yeah, we could have put that earlier, I guess. But happy to answer more. Any other questions from council? Seeing none, okay. thank you very much. Really all appreciate right. that, and thank you for the you. being on your toes. Um, <laughs> For a lot of really good questions. Thank you. It's, it's a privilege to be here, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you very thank much. You. Looking forward to it. Mr. Devin? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Council, thank you again for the feedback. I want to keep 
uh, reminding all of you that the reason why we were doing this is because of your strategic result. You are the, were the ones that asked for the master plan. We obliged. We've done the master planning studies, and now we're bringing back the information to help us make decisions about growth, about development, about conservation, about the other things that uh, were brought up today. And um, this is information that's evolving, um, and we also are, I think, very fortunate, as, as um, you heard from, from Sharon and, and Mary, and, and I know you've heard from Jacqueline in the past, and obviously from Ryan, that we've got new sets of eyes looking at this, applying the best um, uh, judgment that we can, and providing you with the best feedback that we can, so that we can be better in the future about projecting growth and demand and things along those lines. So it's an evolving story, and, and uh, we appreciate your feedback and guidance as we present this information. Thank you very much. Anything else, Mr. Devin? Anything, Ms. Morris, from City Attorney's Office? All right. Thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Like you said, it's a, it's a very important uh, topic that uh, we look forward to several more sessions on. Have a great night.